All right, we are at the top of the hour, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, thank you and welcome to Net DevOps Live. This is our season one, episode two. It's not a dream. Net DevOps CI/CD pipelines can develop, test, and deploy network configurations today. My name is Hank Preston. I'm a developer advocate and Net DevOps evangelist in Cisco DevNet, and I will be your host for today's session. Joining me on the call are a couple of engineers who will be fielding questions in the question and answer panel. So if you do have questions, please feel free to drop them in there and we will tackle them as they go through. And as always, all of the resources and slides and elements that are being used in today's presentation will be available following this webinar up on the Net DevOps Live website for this episode. So without further ado, let's jump right into our session. So what are we going to talk about today? So I've got it broken down into three bullet points, but the vast majority of our time on today's session will be that final one, Net DevOps CI CD in action. My goal is to actually show how all of these workflows and these tools will come together that go through. So how do we combine Git with source control and branches, how to build servers tie in, how to configuration management solutions and network testing look in real life. But before we jump into the demo, we will talk a little bit about <clears throat> network configuration pipelines today. So some of our reality about how we build and deploy network configurations and some of the challenges that we have with it. And we're taking inspiration from the software development DevOps world and creating our Net DevOps CI CD pipeline strategies. And so before we look at what it'll look like for Net DevOps, let's take a look at how software development pipelines look and how they've evolved from the old school days of manual pipelines to their own versions of CI CD. And then that will of course bring us into the Net DevOps CI CD in action. So, network configuration pipelines today. I imagine we've all felt like this sitting inside of a data center working through some operational or configuration issue. And the fact of the matter is we do have some challenges in how we build and deploy network configurations for most organizations today. Likely some of these quotes might even seem familiar to you. They're paraphrased versions of quotes that I've heard from direct customers in my own interactions. Every time we implement a network change, something goes wrong. I know we've all felt that way or we can't update or change the network, our business won't allow it. And that's not because the network isn't seen as important, but exactly the opposite. It's seen as so important that everybody's afraid to let us make operational changes and make these adjustments. And then my personal favorite in the middle, isn't it great our switch hasn't been rebooted in six years. Now we see these going through and I love the fact that we do have this capability from Cisco and using our platforms where we can actually have an uptime on a, an uptime on a device for 11 years, 31 weeks, one day, 16 hours, 46 minutes. But when I see stats like that, we really have to stop encouraging this kind of behavior. Our networks aren't George Foreman grills meant to be set and forgot. We have to keep the care and feeding and the operational aspects. This tells me that this switch hasn't had any significant code updates or bug fixes or security fixes deployed in over a decade. Imagine if this was a Windows or even a Linux server at a tenth of this time and wonder whether you'd be proud of this type of statistic. Now our reality today is that network configuration, right, the way we build them, they're functional, but in many cases are seen as fragile, which has led to many of the quotes that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation here. Network configuration is often more art than science. I know I've been guilty of this, been assigned an operational or configuration task. And rather than running through the steps that I know that I've been taught through my CCNA and NP and IE studies, I just jump right in because my gut feeling tells me where to go for it. And sometimes I'm right, and probably more often than not, I'm actually right. But there are those cases where it would have been better to kind of walk through the, the science approach rather than the gut feeling approach. And then the fact that in many organizations, the tribal knowledge of the key engineers is so critical for all of these pieces that go through. True story. I was working with a customer once on a critical network change, and they actually had their key engineer dial into a WebEx over a VPN connected from an airplane off of Wi-Fi signals and satellite connections because they trusted the Wi-Fi and the satellite connection more than they trusted one of the other key engineers on their team to make these changes. And that's just one example. I know that organizations all over the place have those types of cases. Now the reality around network configuration pipelines today is that we deploy our configurations in a very sequential and manual provisioning approach. We spend months planning these network configuration changes and then we'll have piles of devices, 30, 40, 50 network devices that need to be updated in a given change window. 
and we divide up those devices amongst our team. Somebody gets 10, somebody else gets 10, maybe a couple of the junior engineers get five devices to deploy. And then at 3 a.m. when that change window starts, everybody frantically starts logging into their first switch and copying and pasting config over. And then in the morning when they all come back in bleary-eyed from being up all night, they realize they missed a couple of the switches and they have to file an emergency change request. And these are just challenges that go with the type of manual provisioning. And then that results in these snowflake infrastructure and organic configurations. Despite the fact that all 50 of those devices in that change were intended to be configured exactly the same following the run same runbook, I can guarantee at least a few of those have some deviations based on steps that were missed or individual engineer, kind of the way that they like to do it or the, the, the choices that they made as they go through. And then this organic configuration, more off, I have yet to run into any organization that has the luxury to go back and every time they update a network configuration best practice or standard across their organization that they can update that for all of their sites. And so what we end up with is every site is like a time capsule of network configuration standards at a point in time. And some of those time capsules might be 11 years old as we saw on the other slide. And so these are the realities that we're setting out to change with NetDevOps CICD. Now, when we talk about NetDevOps CICD and concept, a lot of engineers get worried. They're like, Hank, I'm a network engineer. I enjoy working with packets. I enjoy working with routers and switches and configuring connectivity. And this move to NetDevOps and even in this concept of CICD doesn't mean that you're not gonna take advantage and need all of those networking skills. You're still a key network engineer and you're still gonna be driving network configuration. You'll just be using different skills and tools to be more efficient and go through on that and make yourself more valuable to the process you're feeding into your organization. Now NetDevOps CICD pipelines are getting inspiration from software development CICD pipelines. And so let's talk a little bit about how software development process has worked in the past. Now pipelines have existed in software development for as long as we've had software. And it starts out with our developers actually writing the code that has been assigned to them for the projects that they're after. And so once they complete their code projects and they meet those milestones, they check their code into some sort of a repository that begins the pipeline process. The integration phase is our first stage, and this is where integration and test engineers take all of the individual code and compile it together and build the components that make up their application. On those compiled and built components, they actually execute all of the tests to make sure that the software developers have coded things that function independently, but also as a whole to make sure that the entire application is working as expected. Once the testing is completed in the integration phase, everything is handed over to delivery or packaging engineers. These delivery and packaging engineers take the known working code and they create the final artifacts. Now artifacts is just a fancy term for whatever it is that application is at the time of installation. In a lot of cases today, those might be OVA files or MSI executables or bin files in the case of network software as it goes through. And no matter what type of the artifact it is, it then needs to be put into some location where it's available for usage. Here at Cisco, our artifact repository for most of our infrastructure is CCO, so that you can go to cisco.com and find the updated software releases and download them. But artifact repositories also include things like Apple, Apple's um, App Store and Google Play and Docker Hub or these other, other container image repositories to go through. All of that, creating these final artifacts and putting them into these repositories as part of this delivery phase and completed by packaging engineers. Which brings us to the final stage, deployment. This is where the operations team often comes in and picks up those final artifacts and installs the application and configures it for use, making sure that all of these changes that have been, have been made are now updated and available for everybody to take advantage of. Now this traditional process of integration, delivery, and deployment has been manual through the software development space for many, many years. There were people that took each of those steps along the way. And then as the digital age, as enterprises and the pressure at the business and application developers to go faster and faster and release code and new features faster and faster, the manual process of delivering this pipeline just began to, began to get quite strained, which led to continuous development or the CICD idea. And this isn't a complete rethinking of how the pipeline works. Rather, it's an implementation of automation skills and new tooling so that we walk through the integration, delivery, and deployment processes in a more automated fashion. 
And so our CI/CD process looks like this. Our code gets checked into the beginning of the pipeline, and then our build servers monitor and automatically do the compilation, the building, run those test cases. That's continuous integration. Once continuous integration finishes, it can move forward into continuous delivery, the CD portion of CI/CD. In continuous delivery, those final artifacts are created, docs are packaged appropriately, and they're put into whichever artifact repository is necessary for it. Now, lots of organizations can stop there as far as their CI-CD process goes. Continuous integration, continuous delivery. But some organizations are moving all the way on to continuous development as well. As soon as developers have checked in code and it's passed integration and delivery, it automatically gets deployed out to production. Now, that's not something every enterprise and every software development shop needs to do. Many organizations can get all of the benefits they need simply through CI-CD without going all the way to that second set of CDs that's there. Now, as we look at how this looks as we translate into Net DevOps configuration pipelines, the idea behind this is that we're going to be treating the network as code. And this means that our network configurations will be stored in source control because that's where code goes. We work locally in our development environments, implementing our proposed changes in code branches. And so we'll create a, a Git branch that represents our network configuration change that we'll be making. We make and test all of those changes locally before we commit them up into our source control system. And that would kick off our final, or kick off the build in the pipeline process where the automation kicks in. We either instantiate or take advantage of an available test network to make this deployment as it goes through. Our CI/CD build servers will deploy our entire network as code configuration out and then run a test plan to make sure that the network is operating as expected. And this test plan will be robust. It's not a simple matter of making sure that we can ping from one side of the network to the other. We need to make sure that our network applications, our routing protocols are operating as expected. Security and quality of service policies are working as expected. And then at the end of those tests, we can report our status back. If there are any issues that have been discovered, we report them back into the network engineers, the network developers, so they can investigate and repair those problems. And then if they are successful, we can prepare and for those changes to be merged into our production deployment as it goes through. Now to achieve a pipeline that looks like this, our tool bag is adjusting and evolving over time. And our toolkit as Net DevOps engineers begins with network devices, our routers, our switches, our load balancers, our firewalls, all of these devices that are out there. And then wrapped around our devices is this huge concept today of network virtualization platforms. And as I build through our example slides, you'll see some examples of products from Cisco as well as the community and third party locations that can fit into these different areas to help you understand. Network virtualization platforms are used for both production as well as testing and development instances. And then the interfaces with which we configure our network devices are changing. CLI and SNMP are sticking around for a long time. I don't imagine we'll get to a point where they just completely go away, at least not in my career at this point. However, they're being joined by newer interfaces like NetConf and native REST API APIs, which are being backed by data models, either Yang or native data models that go through. And while CLI and SNMP may be comfortable and not going away anytime soon, we do need to begin to move ourselves over to using these new interface protocols because as we tackle a programmatic fashion, we're gonna find that our ability to create these configuration management elements and verify our configs work much better when we can use these programmatic interfaces backed by known data models as they go through. And we can't stop here though. If you have switched over to some sort of a REST API, pushing out configurations through Postman at 3 a.m. are no better than doing it through copy and paste. We need to begin to adopt configuration management strategies. And there is a whole robust world that you can tackle in each enterprise for configuration management. There are open source DevOps tools like Ansible and Puppet that are being heavily used in the network automation space. There are do-it-yourself Python frameworks like Napalm, where you can craft your own configuration management capabilities and utilities. And then there are commercial solutions like Cisco's NSO that can provide this type of impact and configuration management across the entire network. Now, Cisco NSO has long been kind of seen as the purview of just the largest of the large networks, the service providers that have hundreds of thousands of devices. But as every enterprise, large and small, are adopting net DevOps and automation and programmability principles, configuration management capabilities out of tools like NSO are ra rapidly becoming relevant to the entire customer base that's out there. 
Now, just like pushing out from Postman is no good, running a playbook locally on your laptop doesn't get us the whole way either. And this is where we start to get into the Net DevOps CI CD areas. Those configuration management pieces need to be stored in source control. Solutions like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket using open source platforms like Git. We've got build servers that actually pick up and monitor those source control systems. Jenkins and GitLab and Drone, all of these capabilities that can drive these changes as they go through and make sure that we're deployed and tested. And speaking of testing, network test tooling has to evolve. For many years, our best test tool was Ping, but today we've got a huge library of additional tools, solutions like PyATS that let us profile our network and understand if our routing protocols are acting as expected, making sure our layer two and layer three protocols and all of our management protocols are operating as expected. We wanna begin build testing so that we know that our network is operating successfully before the phone calls from the, the uh, application teams begin to come in. And then finally at the base, we end up with our environments. Now the joke is that everybody has a test environment, but only a few people are lucky enough to have a production environment. And while it is a joke, there is some truth to that. I would say that the first place that you configure and deploy a network configuration to, that is your test network, whether or not you call it production or not. In the Net DevOps world, we need to have diligence about having a separate production network, a shared test environment that mimics production as close as possible. And then even more important, we've got these development environments. Every Net DevOps engineer and developer, as they're working through their issues, they're solving their challenges, they need a place where they can test and make sure that their code changes are successful. Test environments are expensive and shared resources. We can't rely on those to find the simple things like syntax errors or mistakes. Every network engineer needs a development environment. So now that we've kind of laid down the basics of what's there, let's dive in and actually see some of these pieces in action and how they work. All right, so we're starting out here. I've got my CI CD as well as my source control system over here on the left-hand side of my screen, and that is GitLab. Now I'm using GitLab in this case simply out of preference. It's one of the tools that are there, and I find it very useful because of its ability to provide both source control as well as build systems all combined together. And then on my right hand side, here's a terminal window for my local development instance where we'll actually be making these changes as they go through. Now the first step in a CI CD pipeline is to find some issue that's open that needs to be fixed. And so here I can see my backlog of issues and we'll go ahead and we'll grab one of these. I'll grab this add network for app three and I'm gonna drag this over to doing to indicate that I'm gonna pick this up and take action on it. I'll click on this issue and check out the details for it. And so we can see we're adding a new network for app three as it goes through. And I've been instructed to use VLAN 303 for this one as it goes in. So as this case, I'll go ahead and start out my process and say, I'll pick this up. So I'm gonna say, picking up this issue. I file a comment so the rest of the folks on my team know what's going on with this piece. And our first step is to create a merge request for this issue. Now a merge request is what GitLab calls pull requests, and these are gonna be changes from proposed branches that get changed in. And so now here we see our open work in progress merge request that's there. It links back, it's created me a branch automatically as it goes through. Now I've created the branch inside of here, but what I need to do is work locally. GitLab gives me this fancy handy button here for checkout branch, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on this, and it gives me the commands necessary for using Git to check this branch out locally. So I'll copy those over and paste them into my workstation here. And I've now checked this out. If I do a git branch, we'll see that I am working on 14 add network for app three as it goes through. Now I'm gonna be working locally on this development piece. Let's get my development environment set up. And I'm using a make command here, make dev. And what make is, makes like bash scripts or any kind of scripting capability that's there. There's a file in this repository called the make file. And the dev keyword lists out a series of different commands to run. And these commands are running to set up a NetSim simulation of my entire production network here locally. What NetSim gives me as a development environment is a management plane simulation of my entire production network. The value of that is as I'm updating my network as code configurations, I can push those out to this simulation to make sure that I haven't messed up or made a mistake in my syntax or tried to apply an incorrect configuration that's there. The idea behind a development environment is not necessarily to replace a full test run, it's simply to give us a first checkpoint through. 
Our pipeline is made up of multiple stages and we're going, we're going to have steps along the way as checkpoints to make sure that things are in good shape. This checkpoint, the dev phase of this, is simply to make sure that my network as code configuration is accurate. What we've seen here is it's now actually pushing out the current, the starting configuration to my dev environment using Ansible. And so we can see Ansible playbook I for inventory, my dev.yaml inventory, and then site.yaml is the same playbook that pushes out my configuration, whether it's dev, test, or prod. And we can see it's pushing out the starting configuration to my entire network. Core has been done, Access is in progress right now, and in just a moment we'll see distribution get pushed out. And that will give me a development instance, a development network right on my laptop that I can use to test my network as code configuration changes. We'll give it just a second for this to go ahead and complete before we move on to our next step. Live demos are always wonderful as you get the bit of weight in there. Oh, good, we're finished here. So here in our play recap, we can see that we have successfully pushed out to access one, core one and two, distribution one and two. And then what NetSim gives me is the ability to actually interact with these devices. Now in normal use cases, I wouldn't have to jump into the CLI, but to show that these are here, I'm good, oops, NCS, NetSim, dash, dash, CLI, C, uh, access, one and I here's the spot where I try to remember my commands off the top of my head when I go off script bear with me for just a second uh, dash H for help and it is oh just CLI CLI C access one and so now you can see I'm connected into access one and if I do a show running configuration we can go through and see here that I've pushed out my starting configuration. We can see the VLANs that currently exist. We can see we've got up to 301 and 302. We'll be adding app three, as well as the full configuration that's there. Now NetSim doesn't give us a data plane or a control plane, it's simply the management plane. So we can look at and make sure our configs are applied appropriately. Now that I've got my simulation, my development environment up, our next step is to go over here and begin making our code changes. Now we'll be adding an additional network to this deployment, and so we need to go ahead and prepare our tests for that. Now in this case, I'll practice test-driven development, which is where we actually apply our changes to the tests before we make our configuration changes. We'll be adding a network to this deployment, and we have yet to deploy passive interfaces to our environment, so our OSPF neighbor count will actually increase from eight to nine. Down here, we'll see where we've got our um, Interface details, I'm gonna add an interface, an SVI on disk one and disk two, so we'll update these to 18 as well, and we'll save those out. Now that our tests have been updated, we can go ahead and make these configuration changes on each of our, each of our devices. We'll start out with distribution one. We're adding a new network, and I was told to use VLAN 302, and so here in the YAML file that's driving the Ansible configuration that's pushed out through NSO, I'll simply add VLAN 303 and app three. I've done this on the distribution one variable file. Now we'll switch over to the distribution two variable file and do the same thing. So we've now added it there. And then lastly, we need to add it to our access switch so that it has it through there as well. Now, if you've done work with Ansible and YAML files, you may be wondering why we're adding this to each individual one. There are many ways to set up your YAML files. In this case, we're just driving each configuration through a single file, or each device configuration through a single file for demonstration. But yes, we could certainly optimize this so that the VLAN was in a single location. Now scrolling up in my YAML file here to where my SVIs are configured inside, we'll find and we'll add the additional SVI on distribution one and two. And so right here, we can see the, the, uh, the block of entry that provides our distribute or the inter the SVI for app two on this switch and I will go ahead and add one for app three. So we'll say app three will change to subnet 133 and 133 and then VLAN 303. I'll go ahead and copy this configuration and then we will push this over to distribution two so that we can get our SVI on both switches. And on distribution two, we just need to change to the IP address for the actual SVI. All right, I've now updated my network as code configuration. Now, before I push this up to GitLab so that we can run our tests, let's make sure that we're actually in good shape as it goes through. And this is the, the value of the dev, uh, the dev environment. 
Now to do our dev test, I've got another make command here, make dev deploy, which simply runs a couple of Ansible playbook commands to push this out to my development instance. When I run make dev deploy, we can see the first thing that ran was a simple syntax check. Syntax checks in this case are part of a phase called linting in CICD. And the idea here is making sure that our code, our configuration files are accurate, that there's no syntax issues or style issues that go through. Because the syntax check passed, that means that I didn't make any mistakes in my actual YAML configuration file. We wanna catch those as early as possible rather than running through a play that goes in. Now in here, we can see it's pushing out the actual configuration, again, using Ansible playbook, using the dev YAML file on our site. And we've made configuration changes to access one, distribution one, and distribution two, as we'd expect. Core one and core two were not updated in this case. Because my development test seems to have, or my development use case and push seems to have gone successfully, I feel pretty good about these change and I'm ready to send this up for a full on test in my pipeline. If I do a git status command, we can see that I've modified four files. I've modified the three host variable files for access one, distribution one, and distribution two, as well as updated the validation test to make sure that these new interfaces are accounted for. I will use git add to add the host vars directory as well as the test directory and stage them to be committed into the repository. Another git status to make sure I'm good, and we can now see that this block does indeed show that they're all been modified and ready for staging. And I'll do a git commit dash m for my message. Now most git uh, source control systems that deal with issues and all of these pieces actually will monitor comments here. So I can actually go in here and say fixes number 14 to automatically link this commit to fix the open issue that I'm working on. And I'm adding app three. Oops. So I commit this locally, and then the final step here is to git push this up to GitLab and my system. When I run this git push, we'll see that it actually pushes it up to my GitLab system as it goes through. And I can go over here and we can monitor the build of this piece as it goes in. If I refresh this work in progress merge request, excuse me, we should see that the pipeline is kicked off here. If I if I click on the pipeline, we can see that it has a single stage, and this is that linting stage that I mentioned. The GitLab pipeline will actually make sure that the syntax inside of my YAML files are accurate. The idea is that though I did this locally, we wanna make sure that we're not counting on every developer to remember every step as it goes through. Now going back to the merge request that's in here, let me refresh so that it shows that it's completed. There, it shows our pipeline is completed, and I feel good about this change, so I'm going to resolve this work in progress status and I will merge this in from my branch into test. And I'll say, go ahead and remove the source branch. We won't need that anymore. So I'll merge this in and this will send it from my branch into the test environment. Now by sending this into test, this kicks off an additional CICD pipeline build. Now this will be the full pipeline build to test and validate the network. We'll go check out the details of this pipeline. We can see once again, it's rerunning the test state to make sure that the YAML files are accurate. Again, every step along the way, making sure that nothing has changed or fallen out of uh, proper configuration. Once that's through, we can now click on the status of deploy to test and we'll actually monitor as GitLab uses Ansible to push these configurations out to the network, the test network, through its linkage to NSO as it goes in. Now the output we'll see here in the screen will actually mimic what we saw when I did the development test locally because it's using the exact same playbook. It's just now targeting we can see here test.yaml as our inventory rather than as the development phase as it goes through. Now we'll watch here as this deployment off to test completes successfully. Or we'll cross our fingers that it completes successfully as this is a live demo. So far, so good. One more. All right, we see here we've got three devices that were changed. It, NSO is doing a final sync to to make sure that the NSO CMDB is accurate and updated correctly. And then this will finish the test deployment as it goes through. We'll go back, there we go, that's finished off. So now if I go in and I look at the full pipeline run, we can see the deploy to test is completed successfully, and that begins the verification step that's right here. 
If I click on the status of the verification, we can go ahead and watch as the PyATS test run to validate that the configuration is configured as expected. It's instantiating and initializing the test at this point, and then it will run through the OSPF, the connectivity, the interface check test to make sure they align with what the test file indicated. We can see in here, uh, let me make this a little wider. There we go. So the scrolling looks good. We can see that we've initialized, passed. We do do a ping, right? We do want to make sure we can connect, but we don't stop there. We can see the OSPF neighbors have validated successfully on the, inter or the counts, and now we're going through and doing the interface count. So, so far, things are looking good in my test, and we successfully finished here. This terminate phase will go ahead and disconnect from these devices and then build the reports for the piece that goes through. What's nice about using a test tool like PyATS is all of the details and the reporting about the status, the commands, any issues that may have come up during the test run are all captured for us so that we can take advantage of those and monitor how the tests went. In just a moment, these tests will actually finish and we'll download these reports to take a look at what they look like and how we can see and dive in should an issue ha had arised during our test case as it goes through. It takes about a minute for everything to terminate and clean up and capture all of those reports, which is why I'm continuing to talk and babble and kill time during my live demonstration today on our webinar. As always, if you do have questions going through, make sure that you're filing them inside of our Q&A panel for our question and answer panelists to pick up. Should be done in just, there it goes. All right, we can see that it's finishing up. It's pulled the outputs and the logs that are there. And it's giving me the ability down here for the job artifacts. I can go ahead and download these job artifacts right within Chrome and then open these up. I will open up that report here in Chrome. Now the green background in here is a positive indication that our tests were done successfully. If there had been any issues or errors during the test, these colors would change, but we can see everything was in good shape, so we're good. If I was curious about what was run and executed during these tests, I can click on the critical tests and then grab one of these. If we check the verify OSPF neighbors task that's here, I can actually go through and see all of the commands, all of the steps that were part of doing this verification. The value of a test library like PyETS is it knows how to do this verification in a consistent way across the platforms, and so you can simply write easy tests as we saw inside of that framework. Now that our test deployment is done, we're prepared, in our, we're prepared ourselves and we're ready to get this prepped for mo moving into production network. And this means in a new merge request. In this case, our merge request will be from test to production. And so we'll say we'll select test here for our source and our destination will be production. And we'll compare branches and continue. And this is moving us from our test phase into our production deployment phase for our change. And so I'll call this deploying app three to production. And we'll say for issue, and this was issue number 14 adding app three. We can go down inside of this merge request. I'll assign it to myself because I'll go ahead and make this change. And then from a label perspective, this is a push to production. We wanna make sure we label that appropriately so that we can get this logged and reported in the correct places. And now that we're prepared, I can go ahead and submit my merge request. Now this merge request has been submitted, but it hasn't actually combined these new test changes into production yet. This is the part where NetDevOps CICD is likely going to maintain a bit of a manual interaction rather than automation. And so we could imagine that a certain point in time would come where we've passed any uh, change windows and gates that go through, and then we would finally say approved and merging. I'll go ahead and comment on this that we're ready to go. And then I'll say, let's go ahead and merge this in. By merging this from test into production, this will go ahead and kick off once more another pipeline because the push out to production also will be automated. If I click on the status of this pipeline, we can watch as it goes. Once again, we start with our lint phase to make sure that our configurations are still in good shape. We don't wanna trust every step along the way. Rerunning the lint is a very low cost, quick activity to go through. So there's no reason to skip the linting at this point. Now at this spot here, deploy to production. In our test deployment, this ran automatically. As soon as the linting was completed, it went ahead and pushed out to test. 
But again, in the Net DevOps world, I imagine we're gonna to wanna to have someone actually executing this change at a specific point in time when we know. And so GitLab here gives me the ability to have this be triggered as a manual action. So I can go ahead and click the play button and this will start the actual push out to production for us. If I click on this, we could actually monitor this through just as we saw it when we did the push out to test. Now what we'll find as we go in, the site.yaml, we're running the exact same playbook, but the inventory file we're using in this case is prod.yaml to target our production environment as it goes through. And we'll see once again, core one and core two had no changes applied, but here we've got access one and then distribution one and two we should also see as it goes through. One more, all right, so that's finishing up the deployment. We can actually go verify that this new network has been added to production successfully. Now my production network for this demonstration is running in viral along with the test network that's going through. So I'm gonna go ahead and change into my viral prod directory in my repository. And then as we've seen in pr plenty of other presentations and webinars that we've got here that we've been doing, we're taking advantage of the viral utils command line utility. So viral nodes will show me that I indeed have my production network here, let me make it a little wider so it's easier to read. There's my production network. And so we'll go ahead and we'll check on distribution one as an example. So viral SSH, dist one. This will connect me into my production distribution switch. And if I do a show VLAN brief, we should see that VLAN 303 has been added successfully through our pipeline as it went through. And if I do a show IP interface brief, we should, brief, we will also see that VLAN 303 SVI has been created and it's up and up. We can finalize and make sure, again, in our operational piece here, just kind of QA and check. If I log in to one of my core switches, we should also see this new network of 172.16.133 available in the OSPF routing table. And so if I go in here and show IP route OSPF, we indeed do see that we have now learned the 172.16.133.0 slash 24 route as it's been pushed through. Now using the CLI to do verifications and validations, I think that's a fantastic use of the CLI. But what we've seen is we did not have to log in and make these configuration changes manually. We're using our pipelines and our configuration management strategy. And furthermore, we're also using standard interfaces to make these changes uh, to the network as it goes through. I'll exit out of our device here. All right, so with that done, let's switch back to the slides and kind of talk more about what we're at. So now that we've seen this, hopefully everybody's kind of had their eyes open and we've all been working really hard at learning skills like model-driven programmability and DevOps tools like Ansible and how to work and build these type of constructs, gone through the fundamentals of Git. But I think once you see the full workflow as it goes through here and how these components fit together, it really kind of ups the ante about what the possibilities for the future of Net DevOps engineering is. And that's what really excites me about these types of concepts. Now, if we talk about the demo that we just went through and kind of seen, uh, talk through the steps that we had. Now, once again, I was playing the role of Carl, the network engineer, engineer here on my development environment, pushing out these configuration changes. And the tool I was using to manage my network as code was Git. And again, Git is different from GitHub. Git is the open source tooling and kind of concepts behind managing the source control systems that are implemented by services like GitHub and GitLab. And so Git is what we used here at the root of our demonstration to manage our version control system. Our infrastructure as code strategy was a combination of Ansible and NSO. Ansible gives us the really easy way to store all of those configurations inside of version control and maintain them and orchestrate the communication between solutions like NSO as well as other platforms that might be necessary. And then by combining that with NSO, we get the power of a full network configuration, dedicate, uh, configuration platform dedicated for an efficient way of managing large network topologies, making it easy to kind of move into this world as it goes through. In today's demonstration, we used NSO to do our NetSim simulation here, but in some cases you may use other solutions like Vagrant to do development environment testing as it goes through. Our build system and source control system once again was GitLab, which gave us the ability to store our repositories as well as act on changes that went in. Cisco's Viral, or CML, but Viral in our case, provided the network simulation for both test and in our case production. 
And all of our network testing was done by using PyATS to validate that our network was operating optimally as expected. And while we didn't end today's demo with a push out to a chat ops window, you certainly could add in integration to WebEx Teams, or, uh, Slack, or HipChat, or any of those other types of platforms that you could then close the loop and monitor inside of the system as it goes through. Now, the reason we push towards this, the reason that NetDevOps concepts are being combined like this, is the goal for what NetDevOps is aiming to deliver. And that's a consistent version-controlled infrastructure that's deployed with parallel and automated provisioning. The consistency is really important to me as a network engineer. I don't want variety across my environment. I want every single one of my network devices to look, act, and operate exactly the same. And consistency is critical for that. Most exciting for me is the, the power of this version controlled system where I can actually know a single source of truth of what my standards are, what my configuration policies are supposed to look like. I can experiment down branches, test out new ideas, but I know this center, this through line, this blue master production environment is what I expect to have deployed across my entire environment. And then finally, we all make mistakes at 3 a.m. on change windows. Manual deployment of configurations are always a challenge that goes through. I wanna get all of the actual pushing out of the configurations into the hands of the automation tools and the robots. Our work as network engineers and developers and architects is making sure that those configurations are valid, that they follow sound networking principles. But once we've gone through that and tested it, let's rely on the tools to make sure that they get pushed out appropriately. Now the Net DevOps Engineers tool bag is a robust one with lots of different pieces made up of open source platforms, commercial solutions, Cisco devices and platforms as they go through. But just to reiterate some of the Cisco components that fit into the Net DevOps Engineers tool bag, let's walk through some of these categories. In the network virtualization space, Cisco's long been making our network appliances available as VNFs, whether those are routers or security appliances, wireless controllers, you can find virtual versions to run on both Cisco and non-Cisco virtualization systems. And our NFVIS strategies for actual NFV platforms from Cisco also support third-party NFVs as you go through. And so if you're looking for a management plane that can actually deploy and manage these NFV solutions and appliances, Cisco can support both Cisco as well as the third-party NFVs that are there. In the device space for many years now, we've been making sure that we've got APIs available. APIs are available whether you're using DNA Center Platform or ACI's APIC as a controller-based intent-driven solution in your network, or if you're maybe in the cloud working with Meraki. For those of us focused on device-level integration at this place, iOS XE, iOS XR, and NXOS all have standard APIs that you can go through and drive the configuration through. And outside of the network, solutions like Firepower in the security area, as well as Cisco's UCS platform, have always had solid APIs to push the configurations through. We talked a bit about NSO, but that really is a solid configuration management solution for any organization trying to find and solve the problem of standard and efficient network configuration management across their entire environment. And then inside the network testing and tooling space, we spent time looking at PyATS today, designing network tests to make sure that our applications in our network are running successfully. Another tool that's interesting and, and worth looking at is T-Rex, which is an open source project from Cisco that'll do traffic generation. So when you build up your test or your dev networks, you can actually send simulated traffic to make sure that the network is operating successfully as it goes through. And then at the base, we've seen a lot about how NSO and Viral and these other solutions from Cisco can help and are, are, are helping to enable organizations to have solid test environments that replicate production. And then also enabling every net DevOps engineer to have a development environment as they go through. So in summary for today's presentation, and we are in good job on time here, let's talk through everything that we've gone in and the resources that you can dive into later. So again, we had three main bullet points. We started out with a look at today's network configuration pipelines and some of the realities and challenges that we have. We looked at how NetDevOps CICD concept is built out of the DevOps CICD for software development. And then we spent a long time walking through the life cycle of how network configurations will look through the CICD framework as it goes in. Now for resources that you can dive into following the webinar, I've compiled quite the list here. It starts out with a handful of uh, websites that you can dive into. So be sure, look at developer.cisco.com slash netdevops. That's the home for all things netdevops where you can track the community and all the resources that are available. 
If you're interested in Pi ETS, slash Pi ETS is the homepage for Pi ETS with code samples, examples, and we're working on learning labs to make those more accessible as well. If you're interested in NSO, we've also got a site on developer.cisco.com slash NSO with information about how you can get started with it. And then viral.cisco.com is the homepage for, to get started with the viral platform, either for test or development use cases. From a hands-on perspective, we've got a handful of learning labs that we've pulled together. I actually brought them all together under a track called Jumpstart Your Net DevOps Journey that's available that will walk you through getting your environment set up, model-driven programmability, all the way up through Net DevOps CI/CD pipelines like we saw today, as well as using tools like Ansible. And I called out a couple of specific links for those modules. Now the demonstration that I ran through today, the entire Net DevOps CI/CD pipeline combined with GitLab and Ansible and NSO and PyATS, this entire demonstration was run on one of our Cisco DevNet sandboxes. Specifically, it's the multi iOS sandbox, which we've linked to a code repository that will quickly stand up this CI CD demo environment simply by running a couple of bash scripts. So within 15 minutes, you can reserve this sandbox and then use the code samples that are available here to actually deploy everything that you saw me walk through today. And then you can begin to experiment and look at how these workflows fit together all on your own as they go through. Today's webinar was designed to show how we bring together all of these concepts around NetDevOps into a holistic kind of uh, body so we can see the value as they're brought together. But there are a lot of components that we can dive deeper into. And in fact, we're going to spend time in the rest of this season in NetDevOps Live talking about a lot of these areas. On October 2nd, please join us where we talk about DevOps style configuration management using open source tools. And we'll talk about solutions like Ansible and Puppet and Chef and Salt and how you evaluate them, Inform important information to consider as you're looking at those solutions. We'll also dive deeper into Git. I used a lot of Git workflows and talked about issues and pull requests and merge requests and worked through those commands during our demonstration. But we're going to spend October 9th, the webinar that's on October 9th, we're going to talk through all of those details so that you can understand the value of moving your, your, source con or your network configurations into source control and the power that the Git utilities and the GitLab services and other Git services like that offer you. And if you're interested in learning more about Cisco's NSO or Pi ETS platforms for configuration management and testing, we've got webinars on those topics as well in later in October. Now, as always, we want to end with a code exchange challenge, right? Get your, get your fingers to the keyboard, start contributing back to the community. And what I thought would be interesting for tonight's code exchange challenge was the idea to create a sample viral topology, and share it with the community up in code exchange. Now, we're all working on different pieces. So whether you're working on your CCNA or your CCNP or designing some new thing for your work that's out there, you need a place to test and experiment. And this, the Cisco Viral platform gives you a great way to build these topologies up and then store them and share them. If you don't have a viral environment of your own, be sure, just go check out the DevNet sandboxes that we have. We've got viral environments you can use to experiment and build, and then combine that viral topology with viral utils to drive this in a net DevOps fashion. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's viral topologies come into code exchange. And then as always, if you are looking for more information about net DevOps, be sure to follow net DevOps on DevNet developer.cisco.com slash NetDevOps is the homepage, and then you can get all the information about the past and future episodes in NetDevOps Live at NetDevOps slash live. We've also got blogs tackling lots of NetDevOps topics, and as always, if you're just getting started with network programmability, I encourage everybody to check out the NetDevOps or the Network Programmability Basics video course. That's available up on DevNet as well. If you have more questions, please stay in touch. I'm available on Webex teams or email at hapresto at cisco.com or on Twitter at hfpreston. And be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias, Cisco DevNet on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, we're just about everywhere as it goes through. And as always, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of NetDevOps Live. It's been a fun one for me. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and we'll see you in our next one. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.